Thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm your host, Daniel Davis. Well, we know that summer is upon us because the kids are out of school and they're pestering us all day long about what they can do to have fun. Geez, Mom, we're bored. You're supposed to entertain us. We're supposed to be able to get together with friends and all these other fun things. Why is it that kids this day and age just don't seem to appreciate the seasons like we once used to when we were kids ourselves? Or perhaps they do and we just forgot. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is one busy lady. Our guest joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program is the owner of the Terra Flora Farm, which is located just south of Seattle, Washington. She's also an active mother of three young men, ages 10, 13, and 16, and she's also on the planning council of what is known as the Ferry and Human Council Relations, which uh, happens in late June, which is in the summertime. She's joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program to talk about the wonderful elements of summer and i'd like to welcome laura sweeney to the beyond 50 radio program how are you doing today laura oh i'm doing wonderfully daniel thanks for the opportunity got plenty of uh sunscreen on for this conversation here dude <laughs> <laughs> yeah indeed i'm ready <laughs> now we've uh covered uh the other seasons it's always fascinating to have a talk with somebody who really adds elements to a season that you probably don't really hear much about, and I'd like for you to kind of talk about that with us uh, when it comes to summertime today. Well, yes, I enjoy our conversations. It's it's helped me to deepen my understanding of the seasons, to to actually have some time to stop and think intentionally about what's going on around me in the natural world and how I can fit into that. That's really a passion of mine, is trying to mm, bring bring an understanding of, of the natural world back into my modern American life because I know I can get so sidetracked with, with all the distractions mm-hmm. around me that I, I tend to forget the simple things of, like what's going on outside my house. And the summertime is such a, you know, it's a funny thing because it, it's, when I started doing these explorations of the seasons, I started doing them because I found myself feeling like I was lacking energy in my other in the other seasons, you know, fall and winter and spring. But lacking energy is not something I associate with summer (laughs) exactly at all. And I think that's because summer is about sun, and sun, of course, is uh, it's a it's power. It in several different cosmology is is the masculine symbol of energy, sun being the masculine, the moon being the feminine. If you look at the Eastern traditions of, of yin and yang, the which are polarities, there's a there's one side and the other. You cannot have one without the other. The fact that there are two defines them. You have the passive influence of the feminine or the yin in conjunction with the masculine influence of the yang or the active component. And the sun and daylight really fills the bill of that active component. It, it gives us energy. It encourages us to, to move into action. And as a culture, we spend a lot of time in yang style energy. That's a cultural predisposition for us Americans. And so when I started exploring some of the the softer, more subtle aspects of fall, winter, and spring, I I was just fascinated by all the really cool things I found that I really hadn't thought about. And then when I started looking at summer, I found myself saying, well, I mean, what else is there to know, right? It's it's sunny. You go outside and you do things. And I kind of had to start from a different place because that action, that action almost got in the way of my contemplation. I was, found myself being so active and full of momentum that I had a hard time slowing down to actually contemplate what I was getting from all of this energy. So it, it was, it, it's been an interesting exercise for me. I've come up with some good stuff, though. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know that summertime, especially if anybody's ever visited uh for instance, Portland, Oregon is a time where there's a lot of festivals. They really like their festivals, but I'm pretty sure it's that way with most of the states around the country. 
Uh, let's talk about some of the celebrations that go on during the summertime that are symbolically fulfilling as far as uh, understanding summer in its essence. Hmm. Now here's an, here's an example of where I started looking for things and I didn't find stuff right off the bat. I started looking in, in various different books I have about cultural um, uh, festivals and customs, um, different kinds of uh, religious traditions. And you know, summertime is kind of blank when it comes to festivals and religious observances. And that I, that shocked me, actually. Mm-hmm. And I started thinking, okay, now why why could that be? And then I thought, well, it's probably because everybody's outside working and doing cultivating and harvesting all of the fantastic energy, and they don't have to get together and manufacture a you know something that acts as a symbolic reference point for moving things along. So uh, the one that I found that is probably most familiar to folks, and, it, and that, that being said, it may not be very familiar to, to some of your listeners, is Lunasa, which is a mid, it's an early August festival. Well, let me back up for a moment. Summer starts with midsummer, midsummer's eve. And th- that always is confusing because, you know, it's midsummer and yet it's the start of the summer. How can that be? But that is, I'm sure many of your your listeners have heard of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is a very famous play. Mm-hmm. And it's an exploration of, of the fairy kingdom and nature spirits and how that playful influence comes into conjunction with human playful influences or lack thereof. Um, and, of course, it's about love. Uh, passion is a, a huge component of sun and the sun energy. And so you have uh, Midsummer, which is, oh, my gosh, you know, what a party. Um, you're starting off the, the, the fullness of the summertime, the heat of the summer, the energy of the summer. And yet what's interesting about Midsummer is that, it is the time when the sun is at its fullest, and from then on, the days actually get shorter, mm-hmm. which seems counterintuitive because it's getting warmer. But the sun is gathering that heat, and it's storing that heat and radiating that heat, and yet the days are, in fact, getting shorter, which is a, an example of that, that yin and yang, that positive and negative, and the, the heat inside but with the edges of, of the darkness on the outside. So you have midsummer. And then about six weeks after that, you have the festival of Lunasa, which is a, a Celtic festival that is about the first harvest. It's traditionally a bread festival. And you have the opportunity to celebrate the fact that you're getting good stuff out of the fields, your first really big harvest, and making bread and making uh, beer are big components to this festival. But, and it's traditionally the women who bake the bread and the men who brew the, the beer. And there also is, because you're still in that sun phase, there's a tradition of, of fertility rites out in the fields, you know, having the, the male and the female component, the men and the women, go out to the fields that are already producing and, you know, do some passionate act to encourage the earth to continue to provide its abundance. So, I mean, that's, wow, that's a real big summertime boost of energy. And then, and then you find that there is a, 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 another festival that really caps the, the end of summer, which is Mabon, which is the fall equinox, which is the end of summer. And once again, it's a harvest festival where you are thanking the earth for the abundance of summer. And, you know, it's interesting. Those really are the two that I can find. Everybody else is so busy (laughs) 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 that they're not talking about it. They're just doing it. (laughs) 
Mm-hmm, exactly. I know just as I was mentioning earlier in the program, it's time that kids are out of school and they have this expectation of keeping them entertained and busy a lot of times. And, you know, and it's kind of funny in this day and age, they don't seem as inclined in the natural world as maybe they used to be because we have a lot of those distractions. I mean, they're on the computer, on MySpace all day long. They're sitting around text messaging, uh, you know, playing video games, watching television. You know, to take them out for a simple walk, for instance, out in a really nice forested park, they just kind of scowl and cross their arms and walk through it just to get it over with. And you (laughs) kind of wonder what you can do to help open them up to really enjoy the natural world, especially in a time like summer where you don't have to, you know, dress in heavy clothing. You don't have to be in a hurry because it's not cold. Uh, You know, it's a very playful time of the year. Mm, That's so true. And here... In our culture, we actually have some things that we do traditionally that benefit our relationships with the nature world, and one of them is camping. Camping, of course, everybody, most everybody that I know of can think back to their childhood and camping trips that they took with their parents or with friends or summer camps that they went to. And these are, oh my gosh, foolproof ways to get back in touch with nature. And I encourage listeners to take their children or their grandchildren, whoever, or friends' kids, and have a camping trip, even something as simple as going out in the backyard, Mm -hmm. but pitching a tent so that you don't have, you're not in a camper, you're not in a hotel room, you are out in nature so that you can feel the dew in the morning. You can feel the moisture as it starts to coalesce at dusk. You can have a campfire. These are all really wonderful ways of bringing the elemental world back into our consciousness. So taking that tent, going out into one of your favorite spots, going online and renting a a spot from the Forest Service, it doesn't have to be elaborate. That's one of the great things about camping because it's so interesting already. Right. As long as you don't allow your, I mean, I encourage folks not to allow themselves to get sidetracked with a bunch of alcohol and a bunch of partying so that you keep your senses clear and you have the opportunity to experience that natural world, not just be in it, but experience it. it it's, I think we do our children and our grandchildren a disservice in not remembering how far they've come from where we were as kids, Mm -hmm. how far culture has come, and that the computers, the the little blackberries, and all of this seductive entertainment that is sedentary, they're not getting out and moving very much, and they're being entertained, they're being fed entertainment. They're not using, they're not needing to use their own creativity to find something and create entertainment. I think we do ourselves a disservice if we, if we forget that that needs to be taught. That's a skill that it's our job to remember to pass along to them. One of the fun things that I really like to do in the summertime with my kids and with neighbor kids is to make fairy houses. And this is something that you can do anywhere. Anywhere that you have maybe some grass or some dirt, pine cones, leaves, grass, sticks, whatever you might have, little tiny bits of of things you find on the sidewalk, string and a, a sequin or two. And go outside, find a nice place that you know is maybe a little shady so you don't get all too hot. Maybe it's nearby where you live or where they live so they can go out and they can visit these little um, habitations later and see how the world, how the nature world changes them through time. But you go out and you find a spot where you can get down on the ground and you start making a little fairy house and allow your, your intuition to speak to you in finding a good spot, in finding a place that might have a little moss, that imagine you're this tiny, tiny, and what that would feel like. And, of course, with kids, 
especially if they're younger kids, they're still there. They still have that wonderful sense of play, which allows them to imagine. And they can take you along with them. They, they can remind us in some ways that it's just really lovely. But go down onto the ground and use what you have at hand. And you can find that this can actually be quite enchanting. You can spend hours doing this. And you can even make a group of little houses. And if, if, your, if your play partner is so inclined, you can leave little offerings for the fairies at their houses. Traditionally, they really like things that have been baked or brewed because they can't do those things. They don't have the free will to be able to um, change natural elements like flour and bread uh, into bread or um, you know, juice into wine or what have you. You might not want to get the wine out with the little ones, <laughs> but you know, taking a little piece of cookie or a little piece of muffin out there and giving it back, the act of building that relationship of allowing that mystery to be true and alive is, oh, it's enchanting. It's so much fun. So that's one really fun thing you can do with kids. And another thing that I really like to do, if you have somebody that you know or you have it in your, your own garden and you, and you grow roses, roses are edible flowers. And if you can find some that you know haven't been sprayed with pesticides or herbicides, and get some honey, preferably raw honey that hasn't been heat treated because that kills all the natural enzymes and, and um, things in the honey. But take those rose petals, find a really fun jar, and pack the honey with rose petals. And you can really squish it in there. Of course, playing with honey is always so fun because everybody gets all gooey, and, and honey is so beautiful anyway. And to play with the beauty of the roses and put them in the honey and be able to look at it. And then once you get just this container absolutely packed with rose petals, put it somewhere dark and come back to it in two or three months. If, say, you're working with your grandkids and they don't, you don't see them very often, maybe the next time they visit will be several months away. Or maybe you won't see them again until Christmas. This is a way of harnessing the energy of the sun and, of course, the beautiful memory of the time that you're spending together. After several months, the petals will start to decompose, not rot, but they'll, they'll, they'll fall apart. And the honey takes on some of that floral essence of the rose. And, oh, wow, toast with rose honey is spectacular. And... You can have it on your, on your toast like in the dead of winter and remember that time. Or you can strain the petals, and you can eat the petals too. Or you can strain the petals out and put them into, say, tea, and you'll still get that amazing floral smell. Smell is so important to us human beings. It's such a deep sense that it will take you and your, your young ones back to that time when you were together and connecting with the natural world. Mm-hmm. That's a really fun thing. It does. It sounds fun. You also bring up something that I think is interesting, too, and that's about uh, eating during the summertime and what the right foods are because you have a hotter time of the year. Of course, eating heavier foods may not be conducive to being active at the same time. Mm-hmm. Talk about some of the uh, ways people might want to consider, uh, because this is also a time that you tend to see a lot of barbecuing, so you got a lot of heavy meat, and, uh, you know, kind of maybe mixing it up a little bit or even changing that. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, barbecues are great because, again, you're, you are in the presence of the element of fire. That's an elemental form. It's not mediated through a stove <laughs> or a pan. It's not piped into your house. It's, you are right out there with the fire. And so I encourage folks to pick up some of those wonderful mesquite briquettes that's not full of all kinds of petrochemical starters and stuff. And so grilling vegetables, grilling fruits. Oh, man, have you ever had, like, grilled nectarines 
or grilled peaches? Well, that was what I started doing a couple of years ago when I barbecued, is I started working a lot more with fruit and combining it with barbecuing, and I was amazed at how how unique that works. Mm. <laughs> and yeah, that's... It was quite amazing, actually. Wow, it's so, so succulent. You know, it's mm-hmm. so juicy. And to add that to a nice big chunk of some, you know, flesh of your choice, <laughs> whether it's chicken or it's, beef or it's pork or it's, or it's zucchini or it's eggplant. You know, whatever your preference is for, for the kinds of foods that you eat, taking it outside and preparing it outside can be a revelation, truly. And I think what you say about eating lighter has a lot of, um, a lot of goodness in it. If you look at the cultures that tend to be hot, you know, Southeast Asia, Thai, Vietnam has this down, I tell you. They have these wonderful um, things called salad rolls where it's all, almost all raw. You take fresh basil leaves, fresh cilantro leaves, um, fresh bean sprouts, and diced or julienne carrots and cucumbers. Cucumbers are big for them. And you, you um, julienne them so they're long and thin. And then you take rice noodles, which are a lighter version of traditional wheat noodles that we would be used to from our Italian heritage, but rice noodles, which are inherently lighter. And you boil up the rice noodles and you get all your little components, your greens and your um, maybe a little bit of grilled, again, we get back to the grill, grilled pork or grilled chicken. And then they have these wonderful things called rice wrappers. And, oh, talk about playing with your food. This is such a blast. They're actually, they look sort of like wax paper. They're usually in a circle. And they're hard and brittle and quite thin. And if you have any Asian specialty stores, you can walk in and ask for this, and they'll know exactly what you're talking about. And you dip them in warm water, these flat, brittle wrappers, and they immediately start to soften. Again, you're, you're, you're dealing with an element. This time it's the element of water and how water will soften something. And this goes from this hard, brittle, almost like glass, to this soft, gooey, um, floppy thing that's like the thinnest pancake or crepe you could possibly imagine. And you lay it out on, say, your cutting board. And you fill it, like you're making a burrito, full of these beautiful, fresh vegetables, a couple of leaves of cilantro and some leaves of basil and a couple of sticks of carrots and, and and cucumber, a little bit of meat, and then you, and this takes some practice, (laughs) you (laughs) roll it up so that what you end up with is what looks like a burrito. It's smaller and more petite, but it's it's got all these beautiful fresh vegetables in it. And then at these Asian specialty markets, they'll also have what's, what's called a dipping sauce. And it's a vinegar and sugar and fish sauce composition. So it's sweet and it's tart and it's spicy, but it's light. And mm-hmm. you dip that, in, you, you dip your salad roll into that and eat it. And wow, my family, we love this because everybody can have their own bowl of goodies that they put in their, in their salad roll. And we have a couple of these containers of the, the sheets, the wrappers, and a couple of bowls of water. And we just sit as a family and we make salad rolls. And we talk and we laugh and make a big mess, and it's, <laughs> and it's really fun. But it, it has the essence of those raw, fresh, especially the greens and the sprouts. Those are fresh right out of the earth. They, they are the transformation of the sun and the earth together, those leafy greens. It's very different kind of food from the sorts of food that you would use, say, in the wintertime, where you're focusing more on the, the storage crops, the, the, the potatoes and the turnips and the rutabagas, things that are starchy and are the root that come from the soil themselves. This is the other end of the spectrum when it comes to eating. And I think it's no surprise that you don't usually run across really heavily spiced foods like gingerbread and spiced drinks, the way you do in the wintertime. The Ayurvedics really understood this because the seeds 
of the plants, which are the spices. Herbs are the green vegetal parts. The seeds, um, the spices are the seeds. They are the end of the life of the plant. The greens are the beginning of the life of the plant, but those, those spices are the seeds that the plant only makes at the very, very end of its life cycle, and, it's a, and it is inherently a storage mechanism. So, yeah, thinking about eating fresh, this is a great opportunity to introduce more raw foods into your diet. Um, raw foods are kind of all the rage right now, which I think is a, a really logical reaction to people eating a lot of prepared foods. Mm-hmm. You know, helping us all remember that we can just enjoy plain watermelon. We can just enjoy plain fruit. We can just enjoy plain greens and yummy salads. And, and, and see how we feel. See how that makes us feel different. I know it makes me feel different. And, and then my goal is to take that feeling different, feeling lighter, feeling more um, more prepared, maybe e- eating less at each meal but eating more frequently, take that into the fall. See if I can have that feeling of lightness and clear energy as I move into a quieter time, a slower time. This also brings up a really nice thing to do in the summertime with or without kids, which is to find a local farmer's market. Because if you want fresh food, you know, the, the best way to get really beautifully fresh food is to buy it from the farmer. And farmers markets are experiencing a beautiful renaissance here in the United States, much much overdue. Mm-hmm. And it's, a, it's an afternoon of fun. You, you can meet all kinds of farmers. You can see all kinds of foods that you don't even know what they are, perhaps. Perhaps you see some, some ethnic vendors that might be offering things that you've never even seen before. Most farmers markets will, will really help you make a day of it by providing entertainment, musicians, crafts for the kids. There's usually um, some fresh food booths, so you can either eat raw or you can get something that's made right there. The smells of the cooking food and the ripening produce, oh my gosh, you know, you can't escape it. It's all around you. You're submerged in it. And actually seeing people who work the earth getting a chance to get out and, and meet your neighbors, meet other people in your community. There's also opportunities at the farmer's market, usually for, for social encounter. And sometimes there's political groups or religious groups that are there. and You can meet some new people, have a nice time, be relaxed. It happens at your own pace. Oh, and the best thing about a farmer's market, let me tell you, is that you can ask for taste. Any farmer that is worth their salt knows that the thing that will sell their produce or their food is for you to taste it. I mean, they can tell you about it all day long, but it's not packaged in plastic. It's not all pre-wrapped and pre-shrunk. And that's part of building the relationship with the farmer is to say, wow, that looks really good. Can I have a taste of that? Or what does that taste like? Or um, are you giving out samples of that? Never be afraid to ask for samples. You can't do it at Safeway, <laughs> but you can do it at the farmer's market, and it's, it's a wonderful experience. I'll tell you, it's always a wonderful experience to have you on the program, especially when it comes to talking about seasons, because you always have a different perspective of the real opportunities of how to actually be in the world, as you've so eloquently described. I'd like you, uh, real quickly, t- to tell us about your Terra Flora Farm Permaculture Garden design? Oh, yeah. Well, this is, this is the, really the culmination of my personal life's work, the opportunity to work with folks in my community. I live in the Seattle area and help them build a relationship with nature in their own yard. And it could be a patio on top of an apartment. It could be a rental house that you're stewarding. It could be property that your family has owned for generations. But wherever you're at, each of us has the opportunity to, to be in the world, like, like you said. And having, having a business where I get to play outside <laughs> mm-hmm. with people all day long and help them connect with their own soil, is, it's a blessing. 
I, I can't think of a better way to work. And, you know, some people, they'll see me out working in the rain or whatever, say I'm weeding or, or setting in plants in the fall, and people will say, oh, my God, you know, how, I'm so sorry for you. You want to come inside and have a cup of coffee or something like that? And I say, you know, this, this is the best life doesn't get any better than this so yeah it's 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 truly um an honor and a blessing to have found my calling that way and a quick reminder for your listeners when it comes to summertime summertime can be a difficult way uh, a difficult time to actually start a garden because it's really dry and plants have a hard time with that but fall not spring is the best time to start a garden because the nature's going to come along and water it for you and the ground is still going to be warm with all of that beautiful summer energy. So whether you call me or you call somebody in your own community to, to help you build that relationship, fall is the great time to start it. Well, very good. Could you give out a website where people can find out more about what you do? Oh, sure. Yeah, I have a brand new website and it's... Um, www.terrafloraharm.com. Pretty simple. And um, on that, you'll see links to the Fairy and Human Relations Congress, links to permaculture sites. We'll have to talk about permaculture on your show one of these days. Now, that's a fascinating mm-hmm. topic, too. And lots of links to, to fun things you can do with your kids, fun things that you can do to, again, to stop, Take some time and get grounded in what's happening in nature right now. It's so easy to get sidetracked. It's so easy to get pulled into the momentum of how our culture works. And it's just as easy to stop and breathe and take the time to reconnect with what's already happening now and now and now outside in the natural world. Well, thank you again, Laura. It's always a pleasure to have you on the program and sharing with us how we can get to slow life down and enjoy it again. (laughs) Mm, Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Such an honor. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Again, it's terraflorafarm.com if you want to find out more about that. And our guest today, Laura Sweeney, again, a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you, Daniel. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. Be sure to visit us at our website, which is beyond50radio.com. That's the number 50 with a 5-0, and sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. We also welcome your questions or comments. Just simply shoot me an email, daniel at beyond50radio.com. Again, thanks for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 radio program, and remember, live your day past halfway. 